The Weighing Machine was created to help you, the financial advisor or investor, reach your long-term financial goals. Each episode, your hosts, Rusty Vanneman and I, Robin Murray, cut through the market clamor to find the time-tested principles that help investors succeed. The Weighing Machine is inspired by the classic investing saying attributed to Benjamin Graham. The stock market is a voting machine in the short term and a weighing machine over the long run. In other words, emotion and expectations drive short-term market movement, but fundamentals and valuations determine returns over time. Welcome to The Weighing Machine. Enjoy, and as always, let us know what you think. On the podcast today, the Goldilocks economy, how long can it last? We will also discuss inflation, interest rates, fixed income investing, preparing for the presidential election, ETFs, and much more. That's with our guest, Jess Sherman from Double Line Capital. Welcome to The Lang Machine. I'm Rusty Vanneman. And I'm Robin Murray. Okay, Rusty, let's start with a look at the markets. What are you watching out for? Well, to timestamp this interview, we are recording at the end of January. And at this point, it appears the Goldilocks economy is alive and well. Economic growth for the fourth quarter, again, surprised to the upside with better than expected GDP growth for the fourth quarter. Last week at 3.3%, that is the first estimate. And estimates for the first quarter of this year via the Atlanta Fed GDP now is at 3%. In addition, inflation pressures continue to fall as the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, or CPI, is now less than 3% from a year ago. How long can this last? And today's guest will have a take on this and also what it means for the markets, especially interest rates. All right, let's bring him in. Jeff Sherman is the Deputy Chief Investment Officer at Double Line Capital in Santa Monica, California. Jeff, welcome to The Weighing Machine. Uh, Thanks for having me. So our initiation on our podcast is we did a walk-up song to kind of set the the mood for this interview. What is your walk-up song for this podcast? Oh, it's a good one. Um, you know, in a uh, shout out to the guys on the desk, uh, I want to do the uh, Hulk Hogan walk-up song, which is I am a real American. You know, uh, you talked about the Goldilocks economy. And so I don't think anything sounds more Goldilocks than, uh, you know, the, uh, the 24 inch pythons coming out, you know, from Hulk Hogan. And, um, I got to say, uh, my physique is a lot different from his. I think if you put my two arms together, they wouldn't in aggregate get to 24 inches. So, uh, yeah. But anyway, that, that would be my walk-up song. Just a, a cool little intro to the mods to the 80s. It feels like it should be in more movies as a montage. You know, I like it. Nice selection. Yeah, and I, 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 I would have to speculate, and again, I'm, I'm not sure, but that that one hasn't been used yet. I thought that was one of the parameters you, you may be using in selecting the song. It is indeed a strong preference that people give us new songs because we are building out the playlist on Spotify. It's like 150 plus songs now, 10 hours, and you just added to the list. So thank you, Jeff. I gave you a whole like two minutes <laughs> worth, I think, too. I don't really know how it is, but I encourage those out there. Go to YouTube, Google it, or go to YouTube, search for it, and uh, just look at Hulk Hogan playing the air guitar. It's amazing. <laughs> you know what? I hope we put that in the show notes, that video link. We should. Yeah. All right. Well, Jeff, tell us more about your background. You've been in this industry for more than 20 years. What drew you to it and what are you passionate about in this industry? It's, it's an interesting question from the standpoint of uh, I feel like I tell the story a lot that, you know, uh, I was a mathematician, academically trained, started off on the pure mathematics side, realized proving abstract concepts just is kind of boring at the end of the day. Um, and switch over to applied math, which just means you actually solve problems uh, versus trying to be theoretical and prove things. And so from that standpoint, um, I did some training on uh, on statistics and econometrics, which you know kind of led me down the path of doing more statistics. And um, again, a part of the specialty was also um, in, in calculus and differential equations. And so uh, I ended up going to grad school uh, to, to study under a PhD program for specifically that I went to Florida State. And uh, I realized that studying statistics isn't very good when you go to Florida State because they do a lot of hurricane modeling. And the hurricane modeling, and it's differential equations, but it's also a lot of uh, thermodynamics. And uh, not being trained in physics was not a good start there. And so I was looking for a transition. um, And um, what I found was that there was a quantitative finance program there. Uh, so I took a, a finance class, decided that this was 
a much smoother path to paying off my student loan debt uh, when I looked at starting salaries of that of a of a finance trained person versus someone that's entering uh, the realm of academia as a professor. And so uh, I did what the the folks call this day a pivot, uh, changed my major, went to change schools, uh, got a master's degree in financial engineering, um, started off as an intern uh, at the previous firm. And uh, from there, as they say, the rest is history. Uh, so what do I enjoy about it? Um, I think this is more important than the background is uh, what I enjoy about it is it's, it's different problem sets all the time. Um, and so someone who likes puzzles, who likes to solve things, um, there's never really one solution when it comes to investing, right? And so trying to help people solve problems, we all talk about delivering solutions to a client. And so um, it's it's that, but it's also the ability of trying to navigate markets, try to disentangle words, try to understand what the Fed's talking about, try to understand where inflation's going. And so it's all these things together, uh, knowing that you know there's a lot of uncertainty. There is, uh, you know, the you may have a conviction, but you can be absolutely incorrect. And so it's how do you survive in a probabilistic world? I think to me, that's the thing that that never changes is that there's always something different. And so, you know, from the standpoint of we, we've seen deflation, we've seen an inflationary environment again. Uh, we see a pandemic, you know, something that none of us really experienced in our lifetime. And so uh, just when you think everything's going swimmingly and you've got it figured out, there's always some new variables that come into play. So I think it's it's that kind of approach to the problem solving that that is the most interesting aspect and keeps me excited about what's going on in the markets. Yeah, that's great. So um, I want to ask you about Double Line as well. So you helped found the company in 2009. Can you tell us more about it and also talk about some of the joys and challenges that you encountered starting the company? Well, it wasn't me specifically. I don't think most people would say Double Line started on the back of Jeff Sherman. Um, but it was more of a different uh, guy that used the same name. His name was Jeffrey Gunlock. And uh, I think a lot of us uh, used his name to really uh, help bolster the company. And uh, using his name is, is an understatement. It's that, um, you know, he, he's been our mentor, our leader for a long period of time. And so I've I've worked under his tutelage for uh, two decades now. And, um, you know, he, he is a great investor and someone that, you know, uh, definitely has uh, gravitas with it within the business. And so um, there's a lot of us around here at Double Line that have that that um, have definitely learned a lot, and you know tried to bring something else to the table as well. And so, you know, starting a company from scratch when you come from a place where our team was running about seventy billion dollars when we decided to start from scratch, um, there's some there's some circumstances around it, but people have heard that since 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 then. So we'll just jump to kind of what's exciting about it. I think it was the entrepreneurial spirit about all of it. And when you look at, you know, trying to to do something, you know, you, you had a group of investors that, you know, uh, we were more institutional investors. We thought institutionally, the way we approach markets is is that framework. And we always had a culture of compliance. You know, uh, we kind of had our own trading rules. We had our own chief operating officer on our desk um, that, that really kind of focused on all this stuff. And so we had the culture of a lot of things. But then you realize as you start a new firm, uh, not everybody has a license to go sell to retail. Uh, not not everybody you know knows how to run an HR department. We don't know how to build out the legal department. So we always had those resources. So I think it was the the challenge of doing that, but also it, the 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 excitement that that ensues from that of looking around to your fellow employees and your and your comrades that are in this battle and the camaraderie that is formed throughout all of it and. You know, I think looking back, none of us will ever forget that episode from 20, 2009 and just the slog that it took to get to really like 2012 and, and start to see that kind of hockey stick a, a approach in the business. And so as as I think back about it, they were they were stressful times. They were challenging times. There was a lot of fun that was had in there. But I think the friendships and the kind of camaraderie that was built over that period is unprecedented from anything else I've seen. Uh, in my lifetime. And, you know, it, it reminds me of just having a, a you know, a, a team uh, in a team sport, right? Where you're just looking to one another, everybody's trying to do the best they can. Um, and maybe you don't know how to play that position, uh, but you're going to learn it. You're going to figure it out. You're going to try to help out the team uh, and do so. And so I think that that is something that um, I will always remember. Awesome. All right, Jeff, let's talk about the Goldilocks economy. So first to define that term, 
that basically means economies in an ideal state is high employment, economic stability, stable growth. The economy is not expanding or contracting by any large margins. And though many still expect the economy to weaken, the labor market, the consumer, and the overall economy continue to surprise to the upside. How long do you think this can last? Uh, well, that's the big question, right? Um, I think the, the what I would answer that with, I don't know how long it lasts, but I can tell you some of the variables that will drive whether it lasts or not. And really the key one is the labor market, right? If we can keep the job growth there, as we're recording today, uh, we saw the JOLTS data come out, the, the job opening labor trend uh, survey that said that there's almost 9 million jobs that are out there available. And so if you look at the kind of continuing claims, the initial claims on the unemployment front, um, they've, they've really just stagnated. They're, they're not giving you any signal that this economy is is struggling with job losses and the inability to replace them kind of on the other side with the jolt side. So, you know, I think the, the, the key variable to stay intact is the labor market. Now, we know that labor, you know, is a lag variable, as we call it in, in, in markets, right? It tends to be one of the last things. You only cut your workforce when you really need to, right? You don't cut your workforce because you think you may have a recession or there's a 30% chance. So we got to trim and, and change our workforce a little bit. Uh, usually you're, you're mired in it. There's something wrong with your business by the time you get around to it. So that's why it's lag. But when you think about unemployment claims too, um, you know that kind of gives you a, an early look at it. So I'll call that a little bit more contemporaneous versus like the jobs reports that we get uh, on the first Friday of, of most months. And so as I look across it, uh, I think as long as labor stays intact, spending stays intact, and that keeps the economy going. And so, you know, if you look back through periods, you know, whenever you start to see the disinflationary environment, typically that's not followed by a collapse in growth. Usually you continue to grow. Um, and the reason is, is that, you know, people are used to higher rates of inflation and it's supposed to help out, although the aggregate price is, is still higher. And so what you find here is that that's kind of what we're experiencing, right? If you look at the third and the fourth quarter, at least off the prelim GDP we got uh, last week on, on the fourth quarter low. So when I look at the economy right now, it, it's hard to see it being derailed without the labor market. Now, are there signs of cracks in the economy? Absolutely. We can talk about that. But ultimately, I think that the, the recession at this stage has been delayed a bit, right? And the credit cycle hasn't kicked in. Interest rate levels haven't had the impact that they historically have in hiking cycles because one, the speed with which the Fed raised rates, right? That time frame, and secondly, also the magnitude. So you think 525 basis points of rate hikes, wow, this should be trickling over every aspect of the economy. But the fact of the matter is, is that there was such a debt burden that was financed at low coupons and low interest rates that has not reset yet. So it's that reset mechanism that tends to cause problems. And I think lastly, the thing that's had this Goldilocks environment is the amount of just excess, I'm going to call it liquidity, right? Because in, in the marketplace, and is this still from some of the programs out there? You know, you think about how much investment was there, the speculative assets going up. And so in general, what you find is that uh, people have done relatively well over this environment, and therefore it leads to that side of spending. Now, there's the troubles, you know, the credit cards, all that kind of stuff. But let's keep it at Goldilocks for the time being. I'm not going to bring in the three bears yet. I I had those on my roundtable uh, when we did the roundtable here at Double Line a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was it was almost like uh, you know I, I called it Goldilocks and the four bears at the time. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, let's talk about inflation real fast. So the Fed's favorite inflation indicator, Core PCE, came in below three percent last week. It's still not at the Fed's preferred target of 2%, but a 2% handle is in the right direction. Yeah. What is Double Line's view on inflation, and how do you think that will impact what the Fed does and what happens to longer-term interest rates? Yeah, I, I think that the, the well, our view, first of all, in the order you asked the questions, uh, our view on inflation is that it, it is going to continue to tick down. And, um, you know, whether you use a PCE, use a CPI, you know, main difference between those two is really the weights to healthcare and housing. That's really the, the two differentiating factors there, where housing is larger in CPI and healthcare is larger in PCE, which usually most people go, how can that be? Um, you know, C PCE tends to be lower than CPI. My healthcare costs don't seem to be rising as fast as this, or my healthcare costs seem to be rising faster than, uh, than, than the housing market. But 
Um, it, again, not getting into the nuance of how they're calculated, we definitely think we can continue on this trend. Um, you know, there's some risk, you know, in short term with commodity prices, of course. Uh, we're seeing another escalation in the Middle East once again. You know, hopefully we're not getting sucked into another war there, uh, which could could cause some more problems. But ultimately, um, we think that that trend is going the right direction. But as you said, we don't think it gets to the Fed's target. So this this becomes like the conundrum for the Fed. Are they comfortable that policy is tight enough to keep inflation contained, but not you know too tight where it's massively restrictive on the economy? Right. We just talked about GDP. Right? That's going to be their measure of the economy, right? The consumption side of it specifically, which leads into PCE as well as you know in the GDP report. So you put it all together, the, the Fed says, okay, well, maybe we can take this higher policy. I would argue that, well, the higher policy isn't completely in the economy yet, right? Because of what we just talked about. So this gets me to the logic of like, I'm not sure the Fed should cut yet. Right, we all want the Fed to cut because it helps risk markets. It helps us feel wealthier. Um, and but at this stage, maybe they shouldn't. Right, they, they have it, and don't forget, they still have egg on their face from when they hiked back in March of 22. Inflation was running like eight percent on CPI at that point in time. I mean, yeah, that's a little off the two percent target. I think we can all agree. So you you start to to look through all of this. So you say, okay, what does this mean? Well, maybe the Fed tweaks policy a little bit. Maybe real yields are too high, right? That is the, the, the yield less the inflation rate. But I think the Fed wants to err on the side of, of kind of not doing things too early. Also, I would argue, does 25 basis points of a cut, does 50 to 75, what does that really do at this point in the cycle? It helps It helps the loan market, right? Even the floats, it helps. But, you know, look, the curve is priced out. If you have access to capital markets... You, you don't care if the Fed cuts rates right now or not. The bond market has the pricing already in for it, and you can go issue in capital markets. But what if you're a small business, Rusty, right? What, what if you're someone that has to go borrow? Well, you pay something called prime rate, and that is key to the Fed funds rate. So, uh, and it's 300 over, plus there's typically spreads. So it will have an impact on the quality, the higher for longer. But if you're borrowing at 11% and that borrowing rate goes to 10%, I don't know. I call me a cynic, but I don't think it matters that much. And so I, that's why I'm not sure how willing the Fed is to do that. So my kind of path for interest rates for this year on the on the Fed fund policy, I'm going to use a math term and I apologize in advance, but I've already used a few. Um, I'm going to call it a bimodal distribution. That is, I think we either get two or three cuts or we get like 250 worse. And the two to three is we continue with the Goldilocks potentially. Um, that things are fine. We grow at potential, call that two and a quarter to two and a half percent. That seems like, hey, there's not this inflationary pressure. The Fed can just settle in. We can bring rates down a little bit. It's a real yield, which is attractive to investors, a real yield that's positive, I should say, uh, which is very attractive to investors. And that means the Fed can tinker with the policy. And then there's the uh oh moment where, oh, may maybe policy being tight has crept into the system. It doesn't look evident today, but maybe as time goes on, we get six to nine months down the road, then the problems materialize and, and they have to move quicker. So uh, I, if I have to handicap those, I'm going to say probabilistically the first one is more likely, right? That it is this kind of slower path. But notice here, the five rate cuts that are priced in them are six actually today that are priced in the market. That's kind of the waiting once again. Are we on the waiting machine here? There's no more so fuck about weights, right? You know, so that's how I'm kind of thinking about pricing. But in the short term, I just don't think we get a cut in March. I think it's a little early, but we're going to get a lot more tomorrow. We're going to get to listen to Mr. Powell himself tomorrow. And I think really on the docket there is going to be the discussion of quantitative tightening. And the QT, whether they start to reduce it, do they change the composition of what it looks like? Do they let the mortgages roll off and buy some treasuries? You know, they are obsessed with this re reverse repo facility and the the dwindling levels in there. Remember, those are still excess reserves uh, that sit there. And so ultimately, I just think that, you know, the Fed, uh, I, I don't know, I, there's something strange about the pivot that took place in December. And I, I thought that the Fed would play this a little bit differently. I thought they, they were signaling a higher for longer and then they recanted, right? They just let it change. Like, Think about the, the last three Fed meetings we've seen. And again, this is before the January 31st meeting that we're recording. 
is that the September one was that financial conditions are helping, right? The bond market, higher yields is effectively saying it's tightening for them. Then we get to November. It's like, well, you know, the bond rally, it makes sense. And then bam, it goes in further. And then in December, it's like, yeah, yeah, we're pretty much done hiking rates. And so there's this kind of change to the tone of Jay Powell where it does seem like he wants to come. So uh, again, I, we're going to have to take these signals right now, me to meeting. I just don't see them getting the Fed funds rate closer to the inflation rate. Uh, I, well, closer, yes, but I don't see them getting down to that level to make real yield zero. Again. Yep. I have one more quick question before I give the mic back to Robin, and that is a question I'm sure you are getting all the time is from advisors or investors, why not just buy T-bills and chill? How do you answer that question? Well, you know, it's pretty chill until your yield goes down, right? Uh, nothing wrong with it. I mean, like I'm an investor, you know, in, in the fixed income markets. And so like I say, well, if you like T-bill and chill, what about low duration and chill, right? It doesn't rhyme. Uh, low duration <laughs> for the nation. I don't know. I'm just trying to call with something on the fly. Yeah. But, um, you know, but but as I think about it, um, you know, look, there, there's nothing wrong with owning a piece of it. And look, we had this everything rally, right, through November and December, right? Bond yields came down, uh, spreads came in, risk assets ripped, um, you know, crypto ripped, real estate ripped. I, I don't know what lost, right? It, it feels like there was no losing. It was the the win-win-win world. And so now, right now, I think a little bit of the T-bill makes a little bit of sense. Take a little bit of chips off the table, but get ready because you need to act. Right. And so look, from an from an investment standpoint, you know, uh, if you look at my portfolio in, in my my personal account, I own some cash, but I always own cash. Right. It's just it's something that you have, it makes you sleep well. The car, you know, breaks down or something, you need it, right? So I, I believe in some of that. But look, I, you know, I have some on the front of the curve. I have a fair amount of intermediate term stuff, right? And so I don't have a lot of that long duration dedicated exposure. It it's through the funds that I own from double line. So as I look through it all, um, you know, I think a combination here is important because what if we're wrong and the probability of that 250 basis point cut is significantly higher? Your T-bill and chill just went down to 275. Nothing wrong with that, okay? Remember, you locked in your one month bill, so you get your 5% annualized for one month, but then the carry goes down meaningfully. Juxtapose that against a 10 year treasury today, 405 roughly as we're recording, right? I don't know. You tell me the Fed's cutting 250. I don't know. I think that I think probably the 10 years inside of three. So 100 basis point rally. We know we get seven points on that. Sure sounds like a better trade. So again, the carry component of the T bill is much more attractive. Uh, but remember, we got to think about things from a total return perspective. So um, my, my counter to that is that. I have no problems with it, but if Jay starts cutting, you got to make sure that you're ready to do something else too. By the way, 25 base points, you may think you have warning, but if it's the surprise 100, 150, and we've seen that, right? It happens. Um, you can change your income stream dynamically, or, uh, dramatically, I should say. Yep. Right. Well, I do also want to ask you about um, an election coming up. It is a presidential election year here in the U.S., how should investors be thinking about that? And is there anything that they can prepare for? Prepare for the unexpected, I would always say, with elections these days. Um, I, I actually think investors really shouldn't care that much at, from an investment standpoint. We can care about all the myriad of other issues that accompany uh, the, the outcomes of an election. But from an investment standpoint, guess what? We know who's supposedly going to be the two candidates, and they both have experience with markets. We know the policies that Trump pursued before. We know Biden's policies today. There's not this massive uncertainty that surrounds Trump from the last time. So from that standpoint, I think when you start to look through it, I, I think the markets aren't really looking at that, that point, at, at this point. And I don't think that they're pricing in much risk because they're kind of no notes, right? We kind of know the variables. We know kind of how it behaves. Now, granted, the outcomes will be something different than all of us thought of their policies. But in general, the, the directive, they're kind of well known. And that's how markets think. So as an investor, you know, again, people get caught up in in um in kind of some of the group group mentality or, you know, uh you know, just just being the fanatic for your 
party or or your side of the uh, of, of the debate, and they don't want to invest because they're worried about the other side taking over, the, the other side continuing, whatever that may be. And so, from our standpoint, you know, we don't see a lot of you know election risk in markets unless it's some exogenous policy that we can't see at this point. And by definition, you, you can't play for that. So. Uh, are you going to give up on the markets just because you think your party isn't going to win the election? Um, it's just a bad, bad philosophy for for going through the investing cycle. Yeah. So it's a quiet oh, yes. answer. Yeah, as you can see, I'm, I'm very I'm very neutral on this right now. And remember, also I live in California, and so um, the good news is we don't even know if there's a presidential election. We don't get any advertising dollars out here. It's a waste of money. Uh, we get all the local stuff, so you don't even get to see the presidential stuff. All right. Well, another one uh, that's kind of related is, so the growth on the federal deficit was a big driver behind growth in the economy last year, which was better than expected. And of course, fiscal spending is not likely to contract since it is an election year, as we talked about. Um, how concerned are you about the deficit and what do you think it could mean for the economy and the markets? Well, I think that the, de- the deficit is a big deal. It is a big deal. And obviously, it cannot continue on on the path it's on. However, it has continued on on the path it's on. And uh, this is where we, we shouldn't have a debate. Is this a red issue, a blue issue? Is a Republican, Democrat? Everybody spins, right? This, this is the, the, you can argue maybe this party does a little bit more than this party. I, I, I don't know. It's what they spend on. And so the deficit has been something, the piggy bank that um, I would say that our Congress people have robbed for many years, and they will continue doing so until a certain moment. And that moment is when the bond market revolts against them, right? And I credit Jim Bianco uh, for for you know kind of putting this idea in my head is that it, it would take an incident to to get Congress to stop spending. It would take an incident such as what we saw in the gilt market, you know, back in what was that twenty two now, right? Uh, yeah, was it twenty two? Yeah, it's twenty two. Cl- Moving to twenty four has really screwed me up. Um, but that that happened back back in the the early fall of, of twenty two. And so what th- what that would entail is that you get this big spending program, it's gonna, and the bond market says rates are 100 basis points higher. It's effectively what happened in the UK. Uh, Liz Truss came out and said that we're going to, uh, she was the prime minister at the time, one of the shortest tenures out there. Um, she came out and said, we're going to cut taxes, we're going to do this QE, we're going to spend money, we're going to stoke more inflation. And the bond market said no, right? Everybody kind of sold it. There was some leverage, there's things that happened along the way. But that is kind of one of those events. They recanted, got stabilization, the market, and you know it was back to business as usual. So I think from the standpoint of you know the deficit, one day the bond market will wake up. That day is not 2024 to it, um, unless you know the the co- Congress somehow coalesces around a deal and says this year we're into a five trillion dollar spending package. It's all going to be debt finance. There's no taxes, you know, something like that. Um, may, maybe the bond market will revolt, but we know right now that the the Congress folks can't agree on what day of the week it is. Um, right now, they don't know; they, they just can't agree on anything because it's so polarized. And so, I, I think that potentially there, there's the ability to contract the spending a little bit, but it's still a meaningful deficit. So, uh, last time I looked, uh, early in the year, we we crossed the 34 trillion mark. Uh, we have kind of a, a we have a little board out here on the trading desk right now that um, people are, are saying where they think it's going to end. And my number is the over on 38 trillion this year. So that's not good, by the way. That's not good. So um, it, it is a problem. It's going to lead to something along the way, uh, whether that's monetization, with devaluation of currency. Um, there has to be a relief valve somewhere, but today's not the day to worry about that. The time to worry about that, Robin, is when we get the next recession. Because if the fiscal response is anything like what we did in the last round, uh, which maybe it won't be, maybe it's half of what we did during the pandemic because there was so many issues of shutting everything down though. But if you do something like that, well, we're getting close to, you know, well, if my estimate's right around 30, 38, we're going to be over 40 trillion, right? I mean, it becomes problematic. And so at some point it has to give, just today's not the day. All right, Jeff. So wrapping everything up that we've talked about so far, how should investors be thinking about their fixed income allocations? Yeah. I mean, look, I I think, you know, you got to play for both these risks we talked about. Goldilocks is a risk. 
right? To a bond investor, that means yields can push a little bit higher. Um, so you probably still want to own a few floaters in there just in case. Um, I think you want to fade the forward curve, that path at least. I don't like the path. So I don't mind owning a few floaters on the front end. But when I talk about floaters, I'm talking about like bank loans, CLO, high quality assets, um, you know, on the CLO market, like AAA. Um, there's ways of, of doing those those kind of trades out there in, in ETF land as well. Uh, but also I would uh, I, I would also want to own stuff that's kind of in the belly of the curve risk. So I'm going to call that like three years. And these are going to be credit sensitive assets. So this is in the Goldilocks scenario. Maybe rates tick up a little bit, but there's enough spread to help insulate some of that incremental uh, move up. Um, I'm going to want to own some kind of stuff in the belly belly. So that's called that like five to the, yeah, maybe seven year point on the curve. I'm going to own rates there. Right, because if the Fed does have to cut um, on that kind of bimodal side, that should that part of the curve will indeed rally meaningfully. I want to own a little bit of back end rates against that as well. So I call that the ten to twenty year part of the curve, maybe a little bit in the thirty. Uh, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be too exposed to the back end because of that deficit ri- the deficit risk that we're talking about. And if we stay Goldilocks, maybe that kind of gets the narrative again, like we had over the summer. And then I also want to own things like agency mortgages, uh, which has been, been a big strike in these securities uh, because the big buyer was the banks. We all know how about the banking system. We saw the uh, what happened back uh, in March of last year um, and some of that. And so they haven't been a buyer. They stepped out of the market. The Fed's been a kind of a net seller in that market. And the people who love it are ourselves, asset managers, the big bond houses. And the thing that we haven't had, along with other houses, is that we haven't had persistent inflows to buy those assets too. So that market has been structurally cheap for a while. Um, but you did get a little bit of the spread tightening back in November and December with the rate rally. But that part's very attractive as a way of taking a risk off bet where you have spread. And so as of like today, I mean, if you buy current coupon mortgages in, in the agency market, they yield like 145 basis points over treasuries. I'll say that again. 145 basis points over treasuries to take treasury uh, to take government guaranteed risk. Now they have prepayment risk, so mortgage rates they come down 200 basis points. You're going to get a lot of your money back. We call it negative convexity. But they also, if nothing happens and we stay at these levels, they, as I said, their current coupon they pay like six, right? They have spread relative to treasuries. They have this kind of um, they have this dynamic out there that can be a risk off. So. Um, I compare that to corporate credit today, 92 over on on the index. Doesn't sound cheap relative to the other one with default risk, but it doesn't have default risk because what I said at the beginning is that, remember, corporate America termed out all of their debt, right? It's fixed coupon, it's low interest rates. So they're not paying these current yields, they're paying lower coupon. So I put this all together and, you know, kind of have a portfolio that has roughly 60% credit very little emerging market debt, very little in the below investment grade space today because spreads have gotten tighter. Uh, we've, we've actually moved a little bit of that to cash uh, as of late, just when there's been some refinancings or we're passing on a couple of deals out there that that we don't we don't really want to participate at tighter levels at this point. And, you know, you put that together in the portfolios, you know, you can put something together, 60% credit, 40% kind of risk off that has, you know, close to a six yield today doesn't sound horrible to me, right? If inflation is going to go to this two and a half, three percent, sounds like a real rate of return. That's pretty positive, right? That can be helpful to investors. So that's what I'm thinking. And if you want to go like crazy out there and take risk, you know, um, you know, I, I think, I think that it's it's just the wrong time. You missed it. I think you'll get another chance. You get another bite at the apple, as they say, on on the crazy risk stuff. But trying to trace triple C risk at this point or very low, low tier single B risk just doesn't make a lot of sense given how how much spreads have come in. And if you want to get risky, why don't you go buy some commercial real estate bonds? Why don't we buy some CMBS? Buy some single A CMBS that yield like 10 and a half, 11 today. We know they're not going to be triple A through the cycle. I'm sorry, I said triple A, single A through the cycle. They're likely going to be double B or maybe even a little bit lower. But I juxtapose that against where the high yield market trades today Sure seems like a known risk, one. You gotta know how to analyze it, two. And three, you gotta have stomach some ball. But when things kick off double-digit cash flows, you can do that. 
And even a lot of the triple C market doesn't do that specifically today. So in general, I, I just think that it's not the time to be a gunslinger with fixed income. Uh, you know, look, if you're going to gunsling and fixed income, sell some equity to do it, right? Just, just like risk for it. And you can put together portfolios that yield double digits right now. But I wouldn't fund that with my traditional bond allocation. I would fund that with the risk bucket. Yeah, good stuff. So a little while ago, you mentioned uh, about currency, but we didn't really like talk about the dollar too much. What is your current view on the dollar? And related to that, what about just your view on investing overseas? Yeah, I, I'm 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 not recommending it at all today. So my view on the dollar is that it, it probably pushes a little bit higher in the short term, at least until the Fed cuts rates. Um, and even though we have this path of the curve out there, the ECB is pretty much done. The Bank of England's told you they're done. Bank of Canada signaled they're done last week. I mean, the the world, the developed world seems to be done hiking rates, except the one that didn't start, and that's Japan. Maybe Japan is the one place where you could actually see this, and uh, that's probably the most crowded trade is is being long the yen today. Um, so it, it doesn't seem that that really that attractive, and I don't know how much you're playing for there. Um, the dollar, I think, kind of just marginally grinds a little bit higher. Um, and I think if we have a recession, it goes a little bit higher, at least initially. And why that is the flight to quality, um, you know, kind of treasuries were under owned. You're getting a bit better now, a little more balance into the market. And so I could see the standpoint of the dollar rallying in the teeth of recession as there's a desire for do for kind of risk off assets. And again, the demand for the dollar in that scenario. However, if we do get mired into recession, um, and, and we start to see that impact and you see Congress start to act, that is your signal to run outside of the country. And so uh, I think that that's really where it is because, you know, we, I was joking, if it's just half, if we throw three trillion at that, you're talking about, you know, something that's still, you know, was that 12% of GDP? It's a lot, right? If we're talking about putting that out there. And so that would put pressure, we believe, downward on the dollar as well. So the dollar is not a trade we're really doing today. Um, you know, the stuff we own in emerging markets today is all dollar denominated. Um, so it has that kind of implicit risk in, in, in kind of the back end and funding on it. But in general, we're not outright taking that because also it doesn't look like you're getting paid for the incremental volatility. So as a bond investor, don't forget, like something I learned early on in my career is that, you know, if you look at the volatility of the bonds and we've had a very volatile last 18 months, right? It's there's no doubt about that. But if you look at the volatility historically of bonds, the currency markets have anywhere between two to four times the volatility of the underlying bonds. So if you're doing that, you got to be right. And it can just create a lot of noise that sometimes it's just not worth the agita I create. So uh, th that's where we are on the dollar today. We're, we're looking we're looking for an entry point to short the dollar, to go into those non-dollar assets. It just it doesn't feel right today. All right, let's talk about ETFs. Double Line has been very effective in helping to make active management more prominent in the ETF space. What are your thoughts on the future of fixed income ETFs and the ETF industry in general? Well, uh, we've been in the ETF business for you know going on like nine years now. We first started this with our foray with State Street. So uh, we sub advised on uh, a Spider Double Line product. I guess it's still Line Spider uh, out there. Uh, product and uh, very, very commercially successful, really able to navigate for the last few years and really instilled confidence in us in the overall wrapper and structure. And State Street's been a great partner of ours over over the years. And so um, that was our first beret. We launched two more with State Street. And so we had this nice little ETF platform. Um, and what what's happened over time is we decided that, you know, uh, again, in some instances, we compete with State Street, you know, because they have competing products with what we do. So we just wanted to be able to access stuff in that in that wrapper as well. So in March of 22, we actually launched our first uh, set of ETFs here at Double Line. Uh, so those are under the Double Line brand. Uh, we still sub advise for State Street. Those are still very uh, they're they're very uh, prominent funds out there. And so from our standpoint, it's just that we want to be able to offer our strategies in that wrapper as well. And so uh, we've, to date, uh, launched four of them. By the time this podcast goes out there, we'll have two more uh, out there in the marketplace. And so, um, you know, we see this being a, a place the market's going. Uh, we haven't done any conversions of mutual funds. We think the mutual fund and ETF systems can coexist. 
uh, especially in fixed income, because uh, a lot of the merits inside the ETF, like some of them are tax related, right? And that that lends itself much better to the equity market than necessarily the bond market, uh, just because we get a lot of income, which uh, the ETF structure doesn't help you turning your your income into deferring those gains. So uh, from our standpoint, it's listening to the market. It's listening to what investors want. And we really saw a significant adoption of ETFs in 22 in the fixed income space, the active fixed income. I think some of that was, you know, in general, they've owned these funds for so long on the mutual fund side. It was just a, t- a cleansing, right? You're down, I'm selling my mutual fund. You know what? I'm going to move to the ETF wrapper. And so just kind of the homogenization or of the book, I think, is part of it. Uh, but in general, I, I think they the ETF, the mutual fund, they can coexist. And it's at the end of the day, what's best for the end client. And so from our standpoint, um, you know, as I said, we have four today. Uh, tomorrow we'll have we'll have six. Um, and, um, you know, we'll see what the future holds from there. But um, definitely uh, something that um, we, uh, we we are somewhat bullish on. And we invested a lot to get our platform up and running. Uh, we're in the you're just shy of a billion dollars in our ETS today. So it is a small part of our business right now, but it's becoming a larger share. And if you include what we do at State Street, it's more than four and a half billion dollars today. So um, we definitely have a um, definitely that trajectory is going the right direction. Right. And the SEC finally approved a Bitcoin ETF in January. What do you think that's going to do to the ETF industry and to Bitcoin? Well, they didn't just approve one. They approved a whole bunch of them and made it a food fight uh, out there. And so, um, you know, sure seems like Bitcoin peaked right around that time. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe the market knew there's a bunch of people that need to buy a bunch of it. And it was a good time to sell some into it. Um, like, I, I don't really have an opinion on crypto. I, I you know, the whole idea mm-hmm. it's decentralized. Great. Uh, but the ETF, is it decentralized all of a sudden? Then you just go through and get a DTC cleared and now you're in the financial system. It's kind of like all these gold people that flock to, uh, you know, the ETFs. I don't want them to pick on any one of them specifically, but if you own it for the end of the world scenario, do you really think that, you know, the end of the world's going to happen? You're going to get your money from your broker. And then there's the ones that hold a physical and they're like, well, I can go get my physical from the, from the vault if I need it. And yeah. End of the world scenario, I just don't think that works either. So I use that as a bookend to obviously I'm not I'm not saying the end of the world's coming for either of these assets, but I, I don't know. I just I, I think it's a speculative asset. I think that the the cynic in me thought it was phenomenal what Gary Gensler did when he approved them to put a scathing commentary around it. Um, but I don't know. M- maybe he just grew up around the banking board a little too much. So again, from my standpoint, um, it's there for people to use. You could do it to these other forums as well before. Does this institutionalize it? I, I think it probably does in some way. It gives it more credibility. But if you want to have the crypto ecosystem, I think you need more of them. So far, the Ethereum one isn't getting through yet. Um, it, it probably does, though, right? Give the people what they want. And look, just understand it's a highly speculative asset. And you should treat it as such accordingly. Don't, don't put them in your asset allocation models because... Oh, let me run a five-year Bitcoin analysis and look, it's up, you know, X percent. It's a diversifier to everything. Just just it's it's all about the buyer beware. So I I think it's I think it's okay. Yeah, look, there's been crazier ETFs out there, right? Uh, and I'm not gonna call those out either, but I mean, there's all kinds of flavor de jours out there. So um again, um, I don't know if it does anything for the ETF wrapper itself. Uh, but I, I, I say kudos to those that work so hard to do it because I have some friends in the industry that have been really working hard to get there. And so let them have their, so far it's their, what, two weeks in the side, you know? Yeah. So Jeff, preparing for this interview, we were told in addition to being a great portfolio manager, you're also known for being a teacher and a communicator. So kind of a compound question here. So on the teaching front, well, just in general, what is your view on the young talent entering our industry and how have skill sets needed to change, if at all, for new people in the industry? Is it no longer sufficient just to read the Intelligent Investor and Wall Street Journal? And I guess what tips do you have for people entering the investment management profession today? How about that? That's a compound question. Yeah, I mean, man, <laughs> that, that thing is growing and growing and growing, right? Uh, was, was, it, was it supposedly, was it Newton that said the most powerful, uh, oh no, it's Einstein, right? Most powerful force in the universe is compounding, right? Uh, anyway, uh, you know, coming back to all that, I would say the skill sets have changed. 
over the last decade um, and definitely over the last two plus that I've been in the industry. And maybe I'm a bit biased, but there's definitely more quantitative skills that are applied to to markets and to the portfolio management crop. You still are going to have fundamental analysts. So we still need people to read balance sheets, financial statements, pull the 10K, 10Qs, look at everything out there. Um, so there's still going to be that fundamental aspect too. But I, I would say the skill set that is almost a necessity now, which was a luxury when I entered the field, is programming. And it's the logic that's behind it. And again, maybe that's because of my my brain, how it's wired. But the logic behind it, being able to set things up, being able to go through that flow of data, and secondly, be able to automate certain things. Now, you know, everybody's like so bullish AI. Well, when the AI can write the computer code for me, and by the way, some of it can't uh, right now, but when it can do everything and it can do all this and, and just say, you just talk to it and say, hey, I want to write a loop to do all this stuff and bam, it does it for you, then maybe AI uh, can replace some of that. But I, I think the programming uh, is, is one of the most kind of um, desirable skill sets now, because even if you're not a programmer, if you're sitting in front of Excel or sitting in front of a database, you need that logic flow. Um, so I think that's what I see about the talent now is that there's more diversity in the skill sets that are coming through. And I think it's just the evolution as a society, we should get more intelligent, right? The assumed knowledge gets better and we learn more as we go through. So I, I would, I would say from that, that standpoint, that's important. Putting on my teacher hat, you know, uh, and someone who tries to help people, I think the best thing also for people is to be able to explain concepts. And I'm not always the best explainer. I know that. Um, but I say that to even people who are learning. When you're learning, explain it to me. Uh, give it to me orally. Give it to me visually. Draw me the picture, right? Give me it analytically as well. So these different ways and verbalize it, be concise, you know, learn how to really be concise with your thoughts, even though I'm very verbose today, right? Uh, be concise, be be direct and to the point. And in this business, that direct and to the point, uh, sometimes we have to make quick decisions, right? And that's what we want. So this morning, you know, we're launching ETFs tomorrow. There's some few things we have to knock out. I mean, it's like, no, answer the question, answer the question. Nope, you're not answering the question. Get to it, right? And so- that is not for me trying to be mean to someone. That's just no, no. You're not. You're not giving me what I'm asking. You're you're circular. You're circular. While your brain's thinking, while you're thinking, turn off your mouth because stuff's coming out that isn't the same. So that that's kind of the. I'm going to put all that together with the academic side with uh, what we're seeing out there in the industry. Yeah. All right. So speaking of preparing. A few weeks after this podcast is published, I'll be interviewing Jeffrey Gunlock for a fireside chat in front of only a thousand plus financial advisors and other finance professionals. If you were me, what questions would you ask him? If I was you, what would I ask him? <laughs> not, not what if I'm me, right? Uh, um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Don't ask him to run the mill, you know. Um, get into the inner workings of thought. Ask him about process. Uh, don't ask him where the tenure is going. Yeah, ask him about how do you how do you analyze something, right? Um, get into the inner workings of his brain, and I, I think that would be interesting to your listeners out there because you know anybody can say, well, this is the level on there, but all that's the gospel. How do you derive it? How did he get to it? What inputs does he use? How does he use these people around him? And I think that that's the thing too. And you know, it's undeniable that Mr. Gunlock is a great investor, and he's done a great job hiring people around him. I feel like I've hired a lot of great people around me as well. Um, and I think this stuff is, is what's important too. And it's process at the end of it. And I think a lot of times that gets overlooked, right? Um, we, we teach people process and repeat, process and repeat. And uh, maybe that's, again, coming back to the sports adage, right? You, you practice, you practice, you practice, and then you have to react. And I think part of that is that process is the practice. And that way, when things develop, you have the ability to go after them. So um, good luck with that. Um, I like as I said, I, I just I just heard it cats. We had a round table here and you know, five really distinct personalities trying to get them to coordinate and not argue over each other. So at least you have him one on one. That was a great forum, by the way. We will have that in the show notes. We'll have a link to it. I thought it was great. Oh, thank you. Thank yep. you.
All right. Well, let's turn now to some of the questions that we like to ask all of our guests here on the podcast. And the first is, what is currently your favorite investment idea? Uh, I like CMBS. Um, I like owning CMBS on the debt side. Obviously, uh, I don't want to take too much risk in that. But I think it's uh, there's been a baby with the bathwater story. I think there's still headline risk. But I think if you're an investor and you have a couple year horizon, uh, this stuff's going to throw off the double digits that it says in the yield. It's just there may be some hiccups along the way. And those hiccups would be buying opportunities. And so um, of, of kind of segments of the market, that, that's my favorite today. Jeff, you have a lot of energy, obviously. So how do you maintain your health, both physical and mental, to perform at a high level in this demanding industry? Caffeine um, is, a, is, a, is a huge one. Um, I just took a drink of coffee myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like, I, I, I probably drink too much caffeine. But, you know, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's finding that excitement in doing things, too, right? And so... Um, you know, sometimes we're kind of down the dumps. We start talking back when we get, we get animated with each other. And so it's finding those things that you really enjoy. Uh, but don't forget to uh, step outside of it as well. Uh, you, you got to go take a walk. You got to take some deep breaths. You got to figure out what works for you. Uh, some people like to meditate. Some people like yoga. Uh, some people have other vices, right? But I think, uh, you know, just having a, a nice combo of things that, that's helpful. But more importantly, whenever you feel stressed out, get grounded again. Right. You know, find something to get yourself grounded, clear your mind, check out, throw the phone away for the night, you know, do something like that. And I'll say, Rusty, one of the things that helped me meaningfully, and I did this right before the pandemic and it really helped during the pandemic, was to separate the personal work life. And you say, how do you do that during the pandemic? It's very simple. You have a work phone and you have a personal phone. That way, every time you look at your personal phone, you're not obligated to look at that email or that thing that popped up. If you're checking out, check out. And that includes the weekends too. Uh, obviously, I don't always practice that. A lot of times I still have it with me, but that is something that, that I really try to do as well. So I don't think I answered your question right, but I'm trying to give more life advice. No, that's some great tips in there. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And hydrate. You know, anytime you're reading an article, it says you have to hydrate and sleep. And I'm like, okay, well, um, I probably don't do enough of the hydration. I sleep when I can't. So <laughs> yeah, I hear you. All right. Well, here's another one for you. We are already have one name, I think, on this list, but you've been around a lot of successful people that have helped you get to where you are today, as we all have. Who are some of those mentors and colleagues that you're thankful for? Yeah, I mean, I, I give a I give a shout out to one of my bosses that taught me a lot. And uh, it's not Mr. Gunlock. It's, you know, I've, I've always learned a lot from him. Uh, but it's uh, Claude Herb. Uh, he, he was a guy that I learned under uh, when I was back at, uh, at TCW. And um, he really taught me to question everything. And that, that was the most valuable lesson. It's like, well, the data could change. Like, did you re-download it? You know, uh, did you analyze it this way? It's like approaching things and not assuming anything. And it came from the whole trust but verify thing. And so um, it's getting into the inner workings and, and ripping things apart. And I think that to me, at least for my brain, really helped develop it in a manner of being able to analyze things and getting to a level where you can see something, just know it's absolutely incorrect. Um, those type of things are very valuable. And so I used to go, how does Ned even look at it? You know, he looked at it for like five seconds. It's, it's obviously, right? He's like, no, there's obviously an error. And I'm like, all right, go back. And, and he would always be start over. Do not try to recreate start over. And I'm like, that's just a waste. Of and, but those kind of things really helped. And it's like, you just lay things out a little different and you find, you're like, oh, I did make a mistake. Oh, he's right again. Uh, he's always right. That's, that's, that's the thing about being a junior analyst. So Anyway, that's someone uh, that I've worked with that really helped me. And then, uh, you know, again, just having people who believe in you and that's having a team around here that believes in you, is, it, it helps a lot when there's a lot of trust with with one another. And then, you know, look, there, I, I respect a lot of the quants out there, you know, the the Carhartts, the Asmus of the world, love reading Cliff stuff out there. Anytime you put something out, anybody who can make the footnotes longer than the piece itself, He's just amazing, and uh, I you do uh, uh, if you haven't read his stuff, beware. You may need a dictionary, or you know, I guess we don't use it anymore. You may need to have the internet really nearby so you can defile all these words because he definitely has a, a very strong vocabulary. I was just reading some of his stuff last night. In fact, so speaking of reading, what are you reading, listening to, or watching at the moment? Any recommendations you can share for our listeners? Ah, uh, yeah. So on on the reading front, right now. Um, it's uh, it's a little bit of a, I can't tell if it's fiction or non, but I'm reading The Fund. 
uh, the, the story about Bridgewater right now. Um, it's just, I don't know, to me, it's, it's more entertaining than, than uh, necessarily uh, learning. I, I did actually enjoy the Michael Lewis book too, uh, Going Infinite or Beyond Infinite, whatever it was called too. Um, you know, I, I thought he got kind of a bad rap that, that people said that, you know, Lewis was a sycophant for um, SBF, but I don't know. I just feel like that's how he writes. And uh, I don't know. I, I thought it was well-written and I learned a little bit along the way uh, to what am I watching right now? Well, I'll, I'm not watching anything because I'm still getting over that, that 49ers game from Sunday. Man, I thought they were going to lose. It was brutal. I'm a big fan. And so um, I'm kind of holding out for the Super Bowl right now, but I, I can't watch anything right now. I, I really used all my attention span that day and my legs still hurt from pacing around the room uh, with my friends and yelling at the TV. So it's probably not the response you thought you were going to get. But I was going to ask about the 49ers. I was going to ask it to be my very closing question, actually. Like, how was your heart doing after the last two weekends? And that's the only question that's going to age fast because this is going to be published right after the Super Bowl. Yeah. So, so hopefully it isn't that weekend that we're talking about how do you feel about hopefully it's elation, right? Yeah. Uh, but that being said, uh, I thought the rain was a ma- significant factor in the Packers game. Uh, I never uh, doubt the Packers. We always play the Packers tough. Niners and Packers just had that always against one another. They, they play very strongly. Um, I did not like the start to the game here this week against, uh, you know, as we're recording to um, this this last week here against the Lions. The Lions just ran all over them. Um, and so I'm, I'm a little concerned about, you know, the, the running game of the Chiefs is pretty strong. They've got this uh, this guy, what was his name, like Kelsey or something? I hear he's pretty good, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, they, I, that's what people are saying he's pretty good. Um, and he's got some powerful uh, girlfriend or something, too, that's bringing some spirit to them. But, um, you know, look, uh, the Niners defense is one of the best in the leagues, and so you got you got you to beat the best to beat the best. So, What's the Chris Hall to- say? What's the score? I mean, I mean, you – this podcast can be published, so we're going to see. I think it looks about. something like the NFC Championship. I think yeah. it looks like a 34-31 or something like that. I think it's gonna. There's going to be some octane in there. They 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 both have good defenses, but I, I don't know. These quarterbacks can both play, and uh, you know, for all the criticism of Brock Purdy, I, I don't know. He, he looked like uh, I look like a NFL MVP kind of quarterback this exactly. week, like coming back, yeah. right? So especially when the game's on the line, so. I don't know, that's why they play the game. You know, Super Bowls can be routes too. So if it's going to be a route, maybe like, you know, 49 nothing with the 49ers went in, that, that sounds like the route I'd like to see. But um, I, I think holding Mahomes to zero is a, a tough proposition. Hey, Robin, your husband, of course, is a big sports announcer. What's his call on the Super Bowl? Um, I, He kind of hates both of those teams, so I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> you're probably oh, Robin. 49ers. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> It's a lot of red, right? You know, out there too. So, uh, you know, it, it it has that emotional feel, right? Isn't isn't red one of the, like the trigger colors, right? That 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 creates these emotions. So, uh, maybe especially that's what in Nebraska. About. Yep. Hey, I think maybe red Nebraska. teams statistically are more likely to win than, than not. I think I read that study well, before. Well, I, I'm going to say that in the Super Bowl, <laughs> a red team is going to win one of them. You know, I there just hope they were in gold. <laughs> Oh, they were on gold band. So yeah. anyway, it should be good. Um, you know, look, the, the championship weekend was awesome. They were two great games. I feel bad for Mr. Flowers and that play right on the on the goal line. You know, that was just a, a tough play. But look, that's why you play the game. So it's a good note to end on. Jen, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been awesome to have you. Um, before you go, tell us how can our listeners stay in touch and learn more about Double Line. Yeah, well, we got a website, doubleline.com. We got, uh, if you want some info, there's info at doubleline.com on the email side. Uh, we put out uh, YouTube channels too. So we have a YouTube channel, backslash Double Line Capital, where you see a lot of our videos, uh, our webcasts. We put a lot of material up there too as well. Um, I do host the Sherman Show podcast. Uh, I've been trying to plead with people that, you know, that there wasn't enough listenership. Unlike, you know, the weighing machine, I think you guys are taking all of our listeners, which is why I came on here. But um, I did announce at the last one, if that more people don't watch it, uh, that we're going to shut it down. And um, I have some of the best YouTube views that we've seen in a long time. So maybe it's my threat of showing it down. Maybe it's the guests I chose. Um, but um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But um, I, I think I'm going to cut back a little bit on the podcast and just do it for, you know, what I think are just kind of more stellar guests. And no offense to anyone I've had out there thus far. I think we just did a lot. And I think people had some exhaustion too. So um, that said, um, you know, you can always uh, reach out to us with uh, Double Line and, and you'll see you'll see all of our offerings out there as well. 
Jeff, thanks for coming on the podcast. So many nuggets, so many things to think about. We really appreciate your time today. And I will see you just so happens right after the Super Bowl. So I'll see you in a few weeks. All right. I'll take the flight out there and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you in person, Rusty. So take care. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. All right. All right. That's going to do it for this week. Rusty, take us out with your final words. Invest well and be well. We'll be back soon. Thanks for listening to The Weighing Machine. And if you liked this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And thank you for your time and trust in Orion. Thanks again for listening. Robin and I truly appreciate you giving us some of your valuable time. We hope to provide you in each episode something you can use in conversations or making decisions or both. If you like this podcast, you might also like some of our sister podcasts at Orion. First, we have Weighing the Risk podcast, which I host monthly on behalf of Orion Risk Intelligence. This is where we consider various market scenarios regarding top of my concerns among financial advisors and investors. Next, we have one of the top-rated and most popular podcasts in the financial industry, especially when it comes to behavioral finance. It's New York Times best-selling author, Dr. Daniel Crosby's Weekly Standard Deviations podcast. And when it comes to all things fintech, we also have the bi-weekly The Fuse Show with Ryan Donovan and George Figuera, two of the funniest guys in the industry. You will learn something and laugh in every episode. For more, including commentary, videos, and other great content, please check out the website, orion.com. Go to the resources drop down menu and find me, plus a wealth of content I create just for you under Thought Leaders. Thanks again, invest well and be well, and we'll talk to you next week. The Weighing Machine is hosted by Rusty Vanneman, Chief Investment Officer at Orion, and me, Robin Murray, freelance writer and editor. If you have feedback or questions about our podcast today, please send us a note at rusty at orion.com. All opinions expressed by Rusty Vanman and our podcast guests are solely their own opinions, and they don't reflect the opinion of or endorsement by Orion, its affiliate subsidiaries, and its employees. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for legal, tax, and investment decisions. The opinions are based upon information the participants consider reliable.